At a certain point in life, a man starts to wonder how he will be remembered when he is gone. This innate behavior is not a symptom of narcissism, nor is it the manifestation of our fear of death, but rather that we unconsciously know that how we will be remembered is of the utmost importance, since the only afterlife we all absolutely know to exist is that of us in memories of others. So some of us can become obsessed with leaving a legacy, while others want that recognition and admiration during their lifetime. But what happens when your personal existence and others' view of it differ to a degree where no one knows the truth anymore? Are you left with having to rebuild yourself with the pieces you and the world agree on? Or will you just crumble into dust like a sandcastle? left to dry out in the sun. Do you remember where we left our investigators? In the dark, with almost total silence, in a place where, even if there is no noise, you will still listen like your life depends on it. There, in the recording booth 3, John Lemieux has gotten over the content of his original email, and into the part that the editor-in-chief Margaret Reed wishes to cover as a backup. I'm pushing 50, and forgive me for the vulgarity, but I should have gotten out of this goddamn town in my 20s. I should have done something with my life. No, I love this place here in the woods, and I've lived here all my life, and it goes back three generations like I told you earlier. This place is important. If you bring up Google Maps and go to these coordinates... And he gives the series numbers so fast that neither of the investigators is able to jot it down. When they ask him to repeat the coordinates and enter them in, John continues. That's my card in here looking at. I think it was taken last year. The satellite picture shows a late 19th century building with three chimneys and a large garden full of color of flowers. The eastern part of the yard has a large brown hole dug into it, and around 50 yards north of the main building, a complex pattern of dark brown and bright green. What's this north of the house? Hammond asks, as he is the one who was operating the computer. That is my hedge maze. Mr. Lemire says with pride in his voice. I made it just like they used to make them and the sale. Do you ever get lost on it? Asks Barkley, hunting for a nice getaway line for the radio segment. You don't get lost in a labyrinth. You go to the labyrinth to find yourself. John says with unexpected weight in his words. The producers look at each other and smile. They are getting golden material and they know it immediately. The conversation circles back on John's hatred of his hometown. We've got almost a hundred churches, almost as many parishes, but nothing in secondary education. With a firebrand attitude, he then lists various crime statistics. Apparently, he knows them by heart. When Hammond later checks them against their statistics, John is quoting a couple of year old records, but accurately. You know, I shouldn't complain, since the people in the trailer park across the highway have it so much worse. It's like I've gotten myself a prison out of my own memories, whereas theirs is much more real. Where I complain that I'm the only one interested in things like astrolabes, sundials and fractals, you know, puzzles for the mind. They have like a real problem making ends meet. But they don't complain, they wallow in their poverty and make kind of an art out of it. Hammond knows there is a word for what John is describing, if only as a style of literature and aesthetics called poverty punk. Or if you are being particularly obtuse with some Kardashian overtones, even trailer part cheek would describe it. Neither expression emanates respect that Judy would like to see given to everyone. Mr. Lemire seems a bit distracted for a while, as if getting lost in some dark thoughts and you can hear heavy breathing even through the phone line. Then he finds the trail to follow and rants on. But with all them churches, it don't mean that we are Christian or civilized. Just this week, me and my buddy was driving back here in the evening, and we see this girl out there by the roadside with nothing but the bright yellow tank top on. No shoes, socks, no nothing covering her nethers either. She's crying and screaming into the cell phone, and you know what my buddy says. I wonder what she's done to be like that. You know, not. Let's go and help her. John is silent for a couple of seconds and then proclaims, That's the way the life flows here, like water around the reeds. The journalists have gotten more material than they could have asked for, and the call has gone for more than three hours now. So they tell Mr. Lemire that they will look into getting an investigation going, and that they will be in touch. Stunned, they sit silently for a couple of minutes when the phone call ends. Then Barkley gets up and says simply, Spin it, a sword hand for making a demo tape for the program, and then walks out into the dim lit corridor outside the booth. Hammond feels as if she is hiding in the audio engineer's booth. The padded walls meant for recording ADR and other voiceovers 
dampen the sounds of even her own breathing, so that it feels as if she's disconnected from reality. Lit by the gloomy light of the sound booth computer monitor, she puts on the mastering headphones and gets to cutting, scrubbing over the recorded phone call, trying to find suitable outtakes and simultaneously writing a copy for the voiceover. She loses the track of time and works well into the night. When the last fade of the demo tape blanks out and the project is done, she slowly puts down the headphones. What they have here is an engaging start of a profile piece about a man so full of contradictions that it reminds Hammond of someone hiding behind a theater mask, or maybe that awful painted face of a sad clown. The enticing way she cut it and laid in the placeholder and radio tracks is almost surely going to be picked up by Maggie Reed as being a bit too sophisticated and upper class, but knowing that the 30 plus year veteran editor in chief will almost certainly see that it is deliberate and necessary to bring out the prejudges in the average NPR listener, there is nothing Mrs. Reed likes more than to stick it to the most uptight part of the dwindling audience. Richard Barkley sits alone in his apartment and stares at the wall with vagrant eyes. Monday night is Christopher's book club night, and even though Richard enjoys a book as much as anyone with an Ivy League education, he just couldn't bear the thought of having to listen to other people's opinions and interpretations of some moderately well-selling piece of feel-good garbage, or God forbid, another freaking Dan Brown. So here he sits, not bored or waiting, but just sitting there with his mind turned inwards and going over the earlier long phone call. The overall copy will be a collaborative effort of course, but Richard is hard at work trying to find the twine that could be used to tie the story together. His apartment is clean to a reasonable degree, not pristine like the stereotype would suggest. There are magazines on the table, not perfectly squared away, and an empty Cayenne bowl. A product of a well-spent Saturday night is still standing on the kitchen island. Like the couple who lives here, the apartment has a kind of lived-in feeling. The scuffs, scratches and blemishes in the paint are there, not unlike the beaten down favorite shirt you just can throw away. This has been Barkley's home for almost 23 years, with the mortgage paid in full for years now, like water around the reeds. He whispers to the empty apartment. Back at the office, faced with the problem of getting home at this hour, Judy stumbles out of the engineer booth and down the stairs to the reporter's lounge, where she is surprised to find an empty cubicle floor. As usually there are several reporters here trying to hide from their life by burying themselves in the stories they hunt. But the floor is empty, the only sounds coming from streets below, where cars pass around the clock tirelessly drowning the city in engine noise. She walks to her cubicle and picks up her bag, double checking that her taser and mace are both on top. She then brings up the rideshare app on her phone and flags a ride to one block away from her apartment. The driver is two blocks away and by the time she pushes out the side door of the studio building, the car is already parked. She waves and driver reaches to open the back door. With an unwearable greeting, she lurches on the back seat of a surprisingly clean and fresh smelling car and as the driver takes off, she stretches her neck as the sounds of the surrounding city find their way back to her ears, as if she had dived so deep in the world of the story she's been editing all night that it took her several minutes to come back to the surface and to reality. Sure enough, after the tape has been played, the 10 o'clock with Margaret Reed ends with her signing off one week's worth of office time and airplane tickets with one weekend stay at a hotel in Alabama. The following Friday, the journalists are off the plane and in the line of the car rental agency in Huntsville, where again we must leave them for a while, as it is dangerous to stay longer than necessary in these memories of others. But watch this space, cause soon we will be releasing the first part of my interview with the prolific children's adventure book author Abigail Walker about her process and sources of inspiration. But until then, World Machine is a work of fiction. Names, characters, places and incidents either are the products of the author's imagination or are used fictitiously. Any resemblance to actual events or locals or persons, living or dead, is entirely coincidental, because reality is more often easily forgotten and changed than fiction.